This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and well, it happens to be just the right time to review the Essential Phone. And I'll try to avoid the Essential Puns. It's almost irresistible to make, make a little fun of that name. But the phone came out about a month ago to much ado because, well, it's, it's stunning. It's gorgeous. It's got the iPhone 10 look before the iPhone 10 had it. And with just the futuristic little camera floating in the front, a little pimple better than the iPhone 10's notch, right? It's made with titanium ceramic on the back, available in black or white. And there's this really pretty green with kind of a bronzy copper accent that's supposed to be coming. So this all sounds fantastic, right? Well, the phone was $699 when it came out, so you expect the world of it. That's flagshipy pricing. Okay, there are phones that are hitting $1,000 now, like the Pixel 2 XL and the iPhone 10, obviously. But still, that's a lot of money. Well, there were bugs because Andy Rubin, who is the father of Android, he went and left Google, and he decided to create his own phone, phone company, the Essential Phone Company. And even he's discovering, oh my goodness, it's pretty hard to make a really good phone commercially, you know? Uh, so there were bugs. It was freezing when it launched. Some people had some connectivity issues. Uh, not that much, though, and we haven't seen any. And the camera was particularly eh. And for $700, the camera should never be eh. So here we are a month later and Essential has been working furiously. This has got four software updates just to let you know how fast they're working on these things. So they are trying and they just dropped the price to $4.99. That's not like a sale price temporary. That's a permanent thing. They claim they could either spend the money on marketing or drop the price, whatever. I don't know if that's really their true reason, but so for $4.99 and it gets to be a lot more tempting. Are the software improvements really there? We're going to find out now. So those of you who are enthusiasts doubtless know what the phone has, but for people who are new here, I'm going to let you know. Snapdragon 835. So you have the top of the line CPU that's available right now, four gigs of RAM inside. And it's pretty good. You know, there are a few phones that have more like the OnePlus 5 and so on and the Note 8, but among its competition, including things like, well, our Pixel 2 right here, same four gigs of RAM. What's nice is 128 gigs of storage for $499. That's pretty darn good. There's no micro SD card slot. I suppose this whole Google influence means still no removable storage. Another thing, it's IP54 water and dust resistant, which means if it gets splashed, uh, it's okay. If you get a little bit wet, like this, believe me, gets fingerprinting so, so fast. You know, I get a little bit wet and I clean it up and it's just fine, but you can't immerse this. You cannot drop this in the toilet without expecting the worst to come of it. Uh, yeah. It has dual cameras on the rear. That's pretty darn fancy stuff. And one's a color, one's a monochrome. These days we either see it being a portrait lens or it being a super wide angle lens in the case of LG or doing that monochrome thing like Huawei has done. And I like that fine because it's pretty artsy. You get some nice pictures out of the black and white feature. You also have a high resolution front camera that can shoot 4K video, which is very unusual for a front camera. There's no wireless charging, despite the fact this has a ceramic back, which allows the conductivity of both radio frequencies and of electricity, there isn't. Because, well, there's titanium underneath here. Yep, it's titanium all around in here, and there's a titanium subframe. So it's missing some of those things that we would like to see in a 2017 super flagshipy phone. But again, now that it's $499, we can live without it. And again, the Pixel. The Pixel 2 that I just reviewed right here, this doesn't have wireless charging either. It is IP67 water resistant though. By the way, we will have a smackdown between these two and I'm going to throw in the OnePlus 5 to make it a three-way, just to make it interesting since it's priced the same as the Essential phone is. So one thing that's a little unusual is the mic nano SIM card slot is on the bottom here. Usually it's on the side of a phone, sometimes the top. It doesn't really matter, except for the fact there's a microphone hole right next to it. Make sure you don't poke the microphone with a paper clip or a pokey tool poke the little SIM carrier slot so you don't break your microphone. USB-C on the bottom, a speaker on the bottom is decent. It's okay. It's kind of average among phones in this price range and up, honestly, other than having stereo speakers, not much is going to beat it. What I really like about this is the straight sides. Why? Number one, here's the Galaxy S8, which is 5.7 inches. But, you know, when you hold them and you put them like that, you'll notice that you get a lot more width available, actually, because the curving of the glass gives you kind of two useless spots on the Galaxy S8. And also the curving means it feels nice in a hand, but it's harder to pick up and easier to drop. This, the straight size, it reminds me of the iPhone back in the day, the most beautiful design I think they ever did for the iPhone. It's not only nice looking, but it's a sure grip every time. So I'll take that. 
In 2017, manufacturers are obsessed with modularity still, just like in 2016. Now, with Moto and the Moto Mods, there were plates that fit across the entire back of the phone. So uh, Moto's kind of stuck, or Lenovo, their parent company, with having to make phones that always have that footprint. So the mods are backward and forward compatible, which they say they will be, and they so far have been. So essential, though, they're being a little more clever here. They have two little pogo pin contacts there, high-speed contacts, and this is where you snap on modular accessories. So far, only the 360 degree camera is available. I don't know, it's around 200 bucks or so, 149. You'll get a discount if you buy it with the phone direct from Essential, but I don't know how many people need that. There will be a wireless charging plate or platform. It'll connect to these two connectors. So that kind of makes up for the fact that it doesn't have regular Qi wireless charging. That's still not out yet. That's one of the challenges with Essential. It, Andy Rubin might be a big name and he might have a lot of funding, so the company's not gonna go away right away, even if they don't sell a lot of phones. That's the good part. The bad part is the fact that they have to spend a lot of time in uh, damage control mode, trying to improve the camera on this and fix the few bugs that it had at launch, some of them being freezing phone bugs, so those were important to fix, and they did. It's taking time away from all the other stuff they're supposed to be doing, like releasing the green version of this phone, like we're re releasing that wireless charging plate. Accessories for this are probably going to be hard to come by, thus uh, certainly the module accessories is just going to be essential making them, but even thing like, things like cases, unless a lot of these sell, and maybe it will now at $499, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of third-party accessories for this. Unfortunately, the phone doesn't have an always-on ambient display. I would like that, or a double tap to wake. It does have lift to wake, and I like that feature just fine, but it's not as good as, say, like on the iPhone 8, where you just pick it up a couple of inches and it wakes up. This, you really have to have a concerted motion of about one foot at a pretty good rate of acceleration to trigger that motion sensor into waking up the screen. And then you can just swipe up to unlock it, or use the very competent rear fingerprint scanner if need be, placed in a very sane location, unlike the Galaxy S8. You can also wake up the phone using Google Assistant by saying, OK, Google, and it'll, whoop, there we go. It just came to life right now, and yeah. The 5.7-inch display on this thing is a thing of beauty. Now, it's one of those 19 by 10 aspect ratio, tall but kind of narrow things. So it really depends on essential updating the phone and adding support for stretching or extending the display on more programs or, or the program makers themselves doing it. Same problem with the Galaxy S8, though they have a pretty robust way of extending the screen, albeit sometimes with distortion there, as well as with LG. But anyway, 2560 by 1312, so that's just a few pixels short of your normal QHD resolution. I like the wideness of it. Like I said, you it feels a little bit bigger because you've got more height when you're holding it in landscape mode, watching a video or something like that. It, the, the colors on this are very rich. To look at it at first, I thought it was OLED. It's very nice. The contrast is very high. They claim 1,000 to 1, and it sure is. 500 nits of brightness is decent, but not super stellar. Outside in our bright Texas sun, I can still see the display, but it gets a little bit harder to see compared to, say, the Galaxy S8 or the iPhone 8. It's about on par with the um, OnePlus 5. It's a low temperature polysilicone display, which is pretty much like IPS. It's, it's nice. And, and obviously, that design, that bezel-free design with just the, the front floating camera is pretty darn nifty and without the whole problem of the iPhone 10 notch system. And look, they came out with this before the iPhone 10 came out, so you can't say they're copying Apple. Performance on this, well, it's a, got fast internal storage, it's got a fast CPU, and it scores fast. In fact, just a little bit faster than the Pixel 2. Not really meaningful, not buying decision worthwhile difference there, but it's as fast as any other Snapdragon 835 phone, and you can see the benchmarks there on screen. No complaints. I've had no hiccups. I've had no freezes, no crashes. Like I said, it went through four separate updates to get where it is today out of the box. So, yeah, it's stable. Definitely very stable. In terms of call quality, it sounds quite good. Again, it works on all major carriers, be it GSM or CDMA, so Sprint, Verizon. Sprint actually sells the phone, in fact. It's the only carrier partnership they have. T-Mobile, AT&T. Some people with T-Mobile have complained about some signal coming in and out. I don't have a T-Mobile active SIM handy to test that right now. I did test it on AT&T and Verizon, and signal strength was the same as other competing carrier brand phones that are out right now, right down to the DB. So I saw no problems with that. The Wi-Fi with Mimo has behaved well for me. It does support HT voice. It also does voice over LTE. Wi-Fi calling, yes, but here it's going to depend on your carrier. Some carriers will only enable that feature on phones that they have certified, meaning phones that they themselves sell. So there's that. 
So the camera, that was the big whoopsie when this thing came out about a month ago. And maybe if they had delayed it a little bit more, it would have helped. But they already were kind of late on shipping the phone. And that's the dilemma with high-tech products. You either set a deadline and you miss it, or you release something with bugs. They released something with a few bugs and with a camera that was, ooh. So I took pictures with the, going through the various stages of update. And the last most important update also requires that you update the camera, the essential camera app but it didn't push it to me automatically. I had to actually go and look for that update. So be sure to do that so you can get the best possible camera experience here. The good news is that they have improved things, improved things a lot. It's no longer a trash camera, but it's not a fantastic camera. This is not up there with the Pixel 2, the Galaxy S8, or the iPhone 8. The best way to sum it up is, as it is now after all the updates, the, the, the photos in the video look like a great camera phone the best from two years ago. It just isn't quite there in terms of detail, depth, colors, all that sort of thing, but it's still decent enough. I mean, the best camera phones from two years ago were pretty good. It's not gonna fool anybody into thinking of a high-end point and shoot or you took it with a, an SLR, let's put it that way, but it's competent. So it really depends on how important the camera feature is to you. If the camera on your phone is your main camera and you're into photography, this still probably isn't the phone for you. I don't know if they're ever going to get it up to par. Why do I say that? Because I tried every camera app. I tried a port of the Google Pixel camera application. I tried Open Camera, which is pretty darn good, Camera 360, to see if it was just Essentials camera app that, that was lacking in terms of processing power. And it actually did pretty good. The only time I would say I would prefer using Open Camera is for video. I mean, video was has electronic software stabilization that's pretty effective versus Essentials own video stabilization. So yeah, it's like I said, it's not horrible. It's competent. You can see the samples on screen, but it could be better. The camera app, well, it's pretty simple, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Look at the iPhone. It's popular. It has a simple camera app. Uh, as long as it has the features you need, and I do like that the, the, the things you use most often are actually right there, like switching to 4K for video, just a tap on the screen, that sort of thing, easily within reach. So that's okay with me, and of course it's Android. You can use a third-party camera if you want. So I think the rest of the improvement is going to have to come from firmware, given the fact that all of these camera applications aren't making this thing shine. And this is the same camera that was used in the LG G6, which is a pretty fine camera phone right there. So it's certainly the hardware has potential. It's a 13 megapixel camera times two on the rear with an F1.85 lens. And the monochrome one actually takes sharper, better balanced photos. I really like the monochrome shots a lot. So if you're into artsy photography, that one's promising. And it shows that there is certainly hope here. Video is okay. It's, you can do shoot 4K. In fact, you can shoot 4K with the front camera too, which is pretty unusual. Um, it needs stabilization. That's why I say use a, something like open camera that does at least software stabilization because in 2017 in higher end phones, you don't expect to see so much jouncing in the camera. Detail could be better too. Your smoothness of movement, you know, all that stuff. It has a 30, 40 milliamp battery, 3,040 milliamps. That's pretty darn large. And it has fast charging. Again, no wireless charging. And it has very good battery life, solid, predictable. This is clean Android. There's nothing added on here except for, well, the, the essential camera app and the software they used to help extend the display all the way up widescreen. So really very good, easily four hours of screen on time, sometimes more than that. And standby times are really excellent. There's no gotchas. There's no weird things draining your battery in the background. So for those of you who like a clean Android experience, one of the reasons is, is often you do get better battery life because you don't have all this extra software running, all these extra processes, keeping the phone a little too busy when it shouldn't be busy, if you know what I mean. So that's the essential phone. You, you just can't deny this is one of the most attractive phones on the market, any operating system. It is just sweet to look at, but a phone is more than good looks, right? Well, now for $4.99, I have to say it's a pretty good deal. You got an unlocked phone here that works with GSM and CD main carriers. So Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, overseas, smaller carriers, all that stuff. So you've got that freedom for only $500 spend. It's hard to say you're going to get titanium and ceramic and an incredible looking edge to edge display here. You know, 
anywhere else for that kind of price. The software is straight Android and it's Android 7.1.1. And I would like to see Oreo. After all, Andy Rubin, the father of Android, he should have connections. I thought it would even ship with Oreo, but it didn't. It's supposed to have it by the end of the year, which might be fast compared to Samsung and LG, but I'd like to see them do these things even quicker. Still, it's clean Android. It's so clean that there's like no other features on here. So some people might feel like it's a little bleh, but I think for enthusiasts, clean is always nice. Will we see ROMs and stuff like this for this? I don't know. It depends on how many people actually buy one at this price. They just might. So definitely I give this thing a thumbs up. It's beautiful. It's not the best camera on the block by any means still though. Will it ever be? I don't know. I'm starting to have my doubts that they have the engineering prowess to do it. I think it's going to be some firmware fixes that are going to be required for this. Not just software since I've tried every camera app under the sun and all the pictures are just meh. All right. And that's about it. But beyond that, sweetness. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.